So next we move on to this uh, history taking of the motor system. Okay. So the most common motor symptom and the most common symptoms in the cranial nerve examining, cranial nerve history taking will be weakness of the limbs. So this weakness we have to initially differentiate whether it is a upper motor neuron uh, complaint or if it is a lower motor neuron complaint. The patient will say and the symptoms will be based on whether it is an upper motor neuron lesion or it is a lower motor neuron lesion. So we need to keep in mind about the differences between the two. So when we talk about the weakness associated with an upper motor neuron lesion, the patient can have either a proximal muscle inv proximal involvement, you know the proximal muscles might be more involved or it can be a distal involvement. The small muscles of the hand might be involved more than the proximal. So or the uh, you know the uh, feet might be more involved than the hip or the knee. So this we have to differentiate. This will this will actually basically give you a pattern. Like I said, CNS examination is based on patterns. So we need to identify a particular pattern which will uh, come you know which will help you in you know associating all the symptoms and coming to a diagnosis. So when we say an upper motor neuron lesion, we will know that the patient will have stiff limbs and the patient will have a, a distal involvement more commonly compared to the proximal involvement. So to identify this, we have to ask the patient some leading questions or the patient might uh, naturally say, but we have to probe some more and ask more questions so that we are able to differentiate whether it, the proximal nerve involvement is more or the distal muscles are involved more. So we need to know that difference. So for that, we need to ask a few questions. So we will basically ask if the patient has any difficulty in taking the comb to the hair. So in that we have to lift the hand over the shoulder. So in that case we can identify if there is a proximal involvement. So the patient will say I am not able to comb my hair. I am not able to dress myself. I am not able to button my shirt. Buttoning is basically involvement of the fine, hair, fine muscles of the hand, small muscles of the hand. So that if the patient is not able to button the shirt, that will indicate that the patient has a distal weakness more compared to the proximal weakness. So the patient might also say that I am having a difficulty in holding a glass of water. I am not able to write. I am not able to lift a bucket of water. So all these things, all these complaints involving the upper limb will help you in differentiating whether it is a proximal involvement or the distal involvement. Okay. And if you think about the truncal muscles, the patient might say that I am not able to change position in bed. I am not able to turn from side to side in bed or I am not able to get up from the lying down position and I am not able to sit up in bed. So all these muscles, if the truncal muscles are involved, we will be able to find these complaints in the patient. If the cervical component is involved, the patient will say that I am having difficulty in lifting my head from the bed. So if the patient is not able to lift his head off the bed, that can indicate that his cervical component, that the cervical components are involved. Okay. So along with all these things, the patient might also say, that he has difficulty in breathing or difficulty in uh, chewing or talking and all these things. This can also be a component of the upper motor neuron lesion. So when you take the lower limbs, uh, we have seen the upper limbs, we have seen the truncal muscles, we have seen the muscles of respiration. The next will be the muscles of the lower limbs. When we consider the lower limbs, the patient will not be able to grip the chapels in his, in his toes or he might not be able to lift his leg, he might have difficulty in walking, he might complain of you know of frequent falls, all these things will indicate a kind of weakness. He might say that I, may, I'm, I have to drag my feet and walk. Okay, So all these complaints indicate that he has a weakness. So it is our duty to differentiate whether it is an upper motor neuron uh, kind of weakness or is it a lower motor neuron kind of weakness. Some patients can have a mixture of the two. It can be an upper motor neuron plus a lower motor neuron kind of involvement. So we need to keep those conditions also in mind when we take the history of a motor symptom in a patient. Okay. So next one will be lower motor neuron symptoms of weakness. So when we say lower motor neuron features associated with weakness, the patient will feel that the muscles are very flabby. The muscles are loose Okay, and the muscles are fasciculating. He will say that I am able to see that the muscle is twitching. Muscle twitching and muscle fasciculations are very commonly seen in patients with lower motor neuron kind of weakness. And again, in the lower motor neuron kind of weakness, we have to see if the proximal or distal component is more. What we commonly see is in lower motor neuron kind of weakness, proximal involvement is more common than the distal muscle involvement. See, if you see in a hemiplegic patient, the patient will have more difficulty and uh, in using the small muscles of the hand. 
okay the, and that will be late uh, the la later one to recover also so the small muscles of the hand will be affected more compared to the proximal muscles which is the shoulder or the elbow okay when we talk about weakness whether it is an upper motor neuron lesion or a lower motor neuron lesion we need to keep in mind that the kind of weakness can be symmetrical or asymmetrical okay uh, if it is a symmetrical weakness we have certain kind of situations certain kind of diseases if it is an asymmetrical kind of weakness we have certain kind of diseases also along with this what we need to see is if there is a particular order in which the weakness appeared the patient might say first the weakness started from my legs then it moved on to my hands and then i feel that my entire body is weak so this is kind of an ascending paralysis some patients may say uh, the weakness started from my hands and then it went on to the legs so that is kind of a descending kind of paralysis or a descending kind of weakness so we need to keep in mind that there are different disorders with ascending kind of paralysis different disorders with descending kind of paralysis so we need to keep in mind whether it is a symmetrical weakness or an asymmetrical weakness we need also need to think about the progression of weakness whether it is uh, whether it is from ascending or descending order and we also need to see when we ask like in any other complaint we need to ask about the onset of the weakness and the progression after that we have to know the present state of the weakness as well so the patient you know a hemiplegic patient he might have developed small amount of weakness he might have overlooked it and he would have waited for one or two days for the weakness to recover he will present to you on the third or the fourth day when you see the patient the weakness could have improved or it could have worsened so what we say as completed stroke the patient will initially have some kind of a tia or he might have a small amount of weakness he might have some minute difficulty in using his lower limbs in using his one lower limb so suppose right lower limb okay so but when the patient produce presents to you after 3 days you will see that the patient you can see that the patient will have full hemiplegia okay that is when the stroke has completed so we need to say the pay, pay, the progress the paralysis initially started as a small amount of weakness and then it gradually increased and in the present state when we are seeing the patient the patient is not able to use his right and right upper and lower limbs completely something like that we should be able to come to a conclusion whether about the onset progression and the present state of the weakness whether it is an upper motor neuron weakness or a lower motor neuron weakness and it is for any symptom that we have to assess the onset progression and the present state which is very very important and we also have to keep in mind that in certain disorders only certain muscles will be involved so we need also need to see if if only a certain if only a thinar eminence is involved if only the hypothenar eminence is involved we need to keep this in mind and ask questions accordingly so so as to assess which actually is the involvement of the uh, weakness either it's a lower motor neuron or an upper motor neuron kind of weakness okay next we move on to the cerebellar symptoms cerebellar symptoms cerebellum is actually the you know the part of the brain which helps in the coordination it also helps in every motor activity that we do so what uh, if you if, if you plan to write so the brain has to act you know uh, it has to send signals to initiate the writing process how do you take the pen how do you hold the pen how do you actually write all these things you know the planning is done and then it is beautifully coordinated by the cerebellum so the cerebrum cerebellum and all other systems including the you know sensory system for holding the pen everything works hand in hand to produce a smooth movement so when we talk about cerebellum the first thing that will come to your mind is in coordination and the next thing that is uh, difficulty in movement okay the third thing will be uh, component of balance so the balance will, is not only about vestibular cochlea it is also about the involvement of the cerebellum that we should keep in mind so in coordination then next will be the motor weakness and the next will be the um, disorder of balance okay so first when we see cerebellar symptoms what the patient will say is he has difficulty in reaching the objects okay he is not able to take the glass of water to his mouth he is having some kind of tremors when he tries to do that so he will say when i am at rest i am not having any tremors but when i take my hand to the glass and i want to drink a glass of water i am not able to drink it and i actually spill the water all over myself because my hands are so shaky it is not there when i am normally sitting at rest so this intentional tremors tremors is very very common and is characteristic of cerebellar symptoms so this incoordination as well as tremors uh, and this uh, movement movement disorder is actually a symptom of the cerebellar system okay 
and you will see that they will have a lower motor neuron kind of weakness lower motor neuron as in the muscles will be very loose and he will also have fasciculations or twitching of the muscles what we should have in mind is the lower motor neuron kind of weakness especially in the cerebellum is ipsilateral this is very very important if the patient is having a weakness i mean if the patient is having a right cerebellar involvement the weakness of the muscles will be also will also be on the right side only okay whereas in cerebral involvement the weakness will also always or almost always be on the opposite side so ipsilateral lesions involve the cerebellum okay so these things are very very important the other complaints that the patient might be saying is he has some difficulty in talking he has some unsteadiness while walking he feel that he is swaying to one side all these complaints are very very characteristically seen in patients in patients involved with cerebellar involvement especially in the involvement of the vermis when the vermis part of the cerebrum cerebellum that is we know the cerebellum has two parts the cerebral uh, cerebellar hemispheres and the vermis when the vermis is involved we will see that the balance is lost okay uh, when the balance is lost the patient will have unsteadiness he will have complaints of giddiness and all these things will occur when the patient is having cerebellar involvement so when we talk about cerebellum what do you think we think about incoordination we think of movement disorder then we think of tremors and we have difficulty in talking and unsteadiness or giddiness all these things come into your mind when you talk about a cerebellar symptom so cerebellar cerebellar system involving the cerebellar uh, system this is very commonly kept as a short case so we need to get this very clearly in your mind what all we are trying to look at and what is the history appropriately that we have to ask the patient okay so this is the cerebellar symptom so next we'll move on to the symptoms regarding the extra pyramidal symptom so system so as you all know extra pyramidal system like the cerebellum also aids in the motor activity of the patient so commonly the common diseases are parkinsons so parkinson plus syndromes or lewy body dementia all these things all these uh, syndromes or all these complex uh, symptoms are associated with the extra pyramidal system which is nothing but the basal ganglia so e when each part of the basal ganglia is involved a particular cyst, uh, particular kind of movement is produced so when the when the patient present with chorea will have one kind of symptom when the patient has tremors the uh, the basal ganglia the one part of the basal ganglia is involved so based on what kind of movement disorder is produced we can identify the site of involvement so what we have to see is when the patient presents with extra pyramidal symptom the patient will we have to ask the history of the patient so the patient will say that i'm having tremors the patient might not come forward and tell you this at all times so the attendants will tell you that he has tremors at rest but when we saw in the cerebellum the patient will have intentional tremors so intentional tremors is very characteristic of cerebellar lesions whereas in the extra pyramidal symptom in involve, system involvement we will see tremors at rest the tremors are usually involving the index finger and thumb finger and the patient will have a characteristic pill rolling sensation it is as if the patient is having a pill in his hand and he is rotating continuously so the pill this pill rolling sensation or this pill rolling tremors is very very characteristic of an extra pyramidal system involvement okay associated with that the patient will have very stiff limbs the patient will have difficulty in folding his legs gradually as the disease progresses they will develop contractures because of the undue stiffness of the limbs which is which is there there will be Uh, as you will see you know the, there will be a general slowness in the activity of the patient the patient the attendants will say when i take a glass of water to him he ta- he finds it very difficult to get up from the bed and he does it very very slowly he has uh, his movements are very slow his movements like just taking the uh, moving his hand from the table to take a glass of water and drink it it takes a long period of time for him to do that and generally his walking has also become very slow and he takes very short steps okay this is a very very classical symptom of parkinsons and other extra pyramidal symptoms also produce similar kind of involvement so we should ask the patient if he has any difficulty in walking if he has any difficulty in doing any activities if he has difficulty in smiling uh, if he has any difficulty in defecation in these patients with extra pyramidal symptoms the patient can also have you know delayed delayed movement of the bowel delayed uh, bladder continence will be difficult so all these associated complaints are also very very common so we need to keep the patient as a whole and try to identify the site of lesion so what will happen in extra pyramidal symptom system is first the patient will have tremors he might have stiffness of limbs 
he might have difficulty in walking he will have a very expressionless face that is also called as mask like facies so if a, if you see a patient with parkinsons you will see that his face does not have any expressions you will feel that the patient is maybe maybe depressed he might not smile at all this is because of the general you know inactivity the patient will have a mask like facies this is also an expressionless face and he will have a general slowness in doing all the activities associated with that the patient may also have some kind of sleep disturbances okay then we move on to the gait so this is uh, this has some this is something that has to be assessed during examination but we need to also ask some part of it during the history taking so the patient says i am dragging my feet and walking so if you see in hemiplegic patients what happens is the normal foot the, the normal side the non affected side will be the patient will be able to keep a step forward but when he has to move the other affected limb the lower limb will be very stiff so the patient is not able to bend his knee and make make the other step make the other step so what he does is he drags the patient he drags the limb around so he makes use of his hip to move the actual uh, move the affected limb to the other side and to make put forward another step so this is called a hemiplegic gait so the patient will actually keep one step forward in the normal side and then on the affected side the patient will use his hips to rotate the leg and then come forward which is all which also uh, you know the patient will feel like he is dragging his foot and walking so this is commonly seen in patients with hemiplegia that is a hemiplegic gait or he might say uh, i am not able to feel the flow so what i do is i take big steps and step on uh, uh, to step on the floor one step will be normal the normal side he will be able to keep it normally but when i have to use the affected side i take big steps to keep it on the ground this is because i am not able to take normal steps i am not able to feel the ground this you can see common in patient with foot drop okay when there is a when the peripheral nerve is involved the patients can develop a foot drop and when the foot drop occurs the patient will actually have a high stepping gait so the patient will take a huge step to actually place the next step on the ground so these kind of gait assessments can also be done through a good history taking you can ask the patient if he has any difficulty in walking and if he has a difficulty in walking you can ask him to explain you can ask him to uh, you know say what his actual difficulty is he will be very able to he will be able to tell you very beautifully what his kind of difficulty is okay apart from the, all these things we should also ask if the patient has had repeated falls so in patients with uh, you know extra pyramidal system involvement the patient will tend to have repeated falls the patient can have lewy body dementia or in parkinsons what happens is the patient is not able to maintain his gait so he will tend to fall sometimes what will happen is the patient can also have buckling of the legs so he might be walking suddenly there there will be loss of tone and the legs will buckle so at that point of time he will not be able to take the next step and he will tend to have a fall okay so we need to keep that in mind especially which is, it is a very uh, important cause of morbidity in the elderly so this recurrent falls the patient may develop fractures so because of that the morbidity increases so when you see the patient as a whole you need to keep all these things in mind You, this will help you to actually give a holistic treatment approach for the patient this will help you in actually avoiding complications when the when you diagnose a patient with parkinsons you should make the home you know user friendly for the patient you should make the uh, you know uh, make the house fall friendly and you should keep the patient away from doing all those activities which can actually produce a fall for the patient you have to keep you know hazardous objects away so that they don't injure themselves when if suppose a patient develops a fall and he has a hip fracture or a fracture of the uh, intertrochanteric region or something like that then the uh, morbidity is increased the patient will be bed bound he will develop bed sores and all these complication will lead on to one to one to another and then the patient might have sepsis and ultimately it might be life threatening also so what could have been a less morbid situation we can complicate it to a more morbid situation or, or it can even end in a mortality so we need to keep in mind all these things when we approach a patient especially when a patient presents with extra pyramidal symptoms